Okay, so last class we talked about, we reviewed all these rules of exponents and roots and stuff like that. Today I want to talk about the next step in that, another operation. And just, I know I've mentioned this before, but our operations come in pairs. We have addition and subtraction that's a pair of operations. If you're looking at addition and subtraction, somebody pick a random number between 1 and 10. What's that? 7. 7. Okay. Somebody pick another random number between 1 and 10. 10. So if I take 7 plus 10, I get 17. Now if I take that 17 and I want to get back to 10, or back to 7, what do I do? I subtract the 10. Get back to 7. So if I look at here, adding 10 and subtracting 10 are the opposite of each other. They undo each other. So if I add 10 and subtract 10, I get right back to where I started. Well, the same thing happens with multiplication and division. Give me a, another random number between 1 and 10. 4. And then another one. 1. Uh, I guess I'm a little more exciting. I should say 2 and 10. You said 3? So 4 times 3 is 12. If I take that 12 and I want to turn it back into a 4, what do I do? I divide by 3. So multiplying and dividing are opposites. You multiply by a number to get back to where you started, you divide by the same number. And then we even explored powers and roots. Give me a random number between 1 and 10 again, or 2 and 10. 2. Give me another one. 10. 2 to the 10th power is 1,024. If I want to get from that 1,024 back to the 2, what do I have to do? 10th root. It was a 10th power to get from 2 to 1,024. It's a 10th root to get back to 2. So powers and roots can reverse each other if they have the same, if the power matches the index of the root. Well, today we're going to learn a new operation. So we have those six basic operations. Today we're going to learn a new operation. There are actually a pair of new operations. And it's called an exponential. So far, when we've been looking at equations, things have been happening to the variable. Like we have you know, something like this. Here... The variable x has been multiplied by 3 and 2 has been added to it. To solve it, you reverse it. You subtract the 2 divided by 3. Or we might have something like this. The variable x has been taken to a power. It's been squared. Well, what we're going to look at today is what if the variable is what is doing the action? So what if we have... 3 to the power of x equals 81. So now it's not x that's having something happen to it. It's x that's actually doing the action. The number isn't doing something to x. x is doing something to the number. And this is what we call an exponential. The variable is in the power of the exponent rather than the base. Here, the variable is in the base of the exponent. Now it's in the power. The opposite of an exponential is something called a logarithm. A logarithm is saying, okay, how do we remove that base and get back to x? Just like with our other operations, we have to use the same number. We're going back up here. If we added 10, we have to subtract 10. If we multiplied by 3, we had to divide by 3. If we did the 10th power, we have to do the 10th root. Same here. It's 3 to the power of. 3 is the base of our exponential. 3 would also be the base of our log. It would be a log base 3. That's going to do the opposite of 3 to the power of x. So this is asking 3 to what power equals 81. 
If I do a log base 3 of 3 to the x, the log base 3 and the 3, the, the 3 as the base of the exponent cancel out, that would just give me x. And what I'm left over is going to be the result. So the log base 3 of 81 has to make this true. It's going to be 4. 3 to the power of 4 is 81. Well, today we're going to focus on this side of it, the exponential side of it. Next week, we're going to look more at the logarithm side of it. But be aware that this is, this is a pair of operations, just like every other operation. And we're going to look at going forward and going in reverse. First thing we're we'll do is we are going to graph an exponential. So I'm going to graph y equals 2 to the power of x. So if I make a table of values, x and y, I'm going to start out like negative 3, negative 1, 0, 1, and 3 for values of x. You did this last semester, right? Made a table, figure out the points, put them on a graph. Well, here our equation is a little different. It's 2 to the power of x. So what is 2 to the power of negative 3? If you punch that in your calculator, you get 0.125, or 1 eighth. So if x is negative 3, y is 0.125. That's right there. Negative 1, what is 2 to the power of negative 1? Point 0.5, or 1 half. So when x is negative 1, y is 1 half, point 0.5. How about 2 to the power of 0? 1. Anything to the power of 0 is 1. So at 0, this is 1. How about 2 to the power of 1? It's 2. So at x equals 1, y equals 2. How about 2 to the power of 3? Careful. 8. 2 times 2 times 2? Z. Very good. So at x is 3, y is 8. So what we get here is this curve. Looks something like that. So you can see it forms this nice curve here. Almost looks like a boomerang if you, if you picture it. And that's the typical shape of an exponential. Now this is what we would call exponential growth. And it's, it's growth because it's getting larger. And usually what we're concerned with is the portion of this graph that starts at zero and goes on to the right here. So we're looking at this section right here. Because generally when we're dealing with exponentials, rather than x, what we're actually dealing with is time. So that's t. And of course at time zero, there's, that's where we start paying attention. So that's what we're concerned with is that section of the graph. And you can see here, it starts out at 1. That's where exponentials are really handy. That initial value, anything to the power of 0 is 1. So it starts out at one whole thing and then grows from there. There is also exponential decay. Good luck. And in exponential decay, we're looking at shrinking almost uh, think of radioactivity half-life that's a form of exponential decay charge in a capacitor then can be a form of exponential decay so if we take a look at this decay would look like this y equals 2 to the power of negative x now do you see the difference between those for growth that was our equation so the only difference is the negative in the exponent, in the power, on the variable. What that is going to look like is 
I'll actually put one up here. When I make my table, I'm going to start at just x equals 0, 1, 2, and 3. It doesn't really matter. I mean, I'm just starting out there. You might have a ton. It should specify what values, or if it just says sketch a graph. Like typically, if I'm just told to sketch a graph, these are the values I use for x. Negative 3, negative 1, 0, 1, and 3. This gives me a nice little spread across the graph. But since I've already said that this is the part of the graph we're, we're interested in, I'm just starting at 0 so I can just concentrate on that part of the graph. So here, if x is 0, 2 to the power of negative 0 is just 2 to the power of 0, which is 1. So at 0, y is 1 right there. If x is 1, 2 to the negative 1, of course, is, careful, it's negative 1, 0.5. Yep. So that's going to be 0 point, or 1.5. If x is 2, 2 to the negative 2 is, careful, 0.25, 1 fourth. And, of course, 2 to the negative 3 is 0.125. So you see what happens is at each point it gets closer and closer and closer and closer to 0. Will it ever reach 0? No, it doesn't. Each time it goes up a number, it gets cut in half. Well, because that's a 2. If it were a 3 there, each time it goes up, one, the x goes up 1, it would get cut to a third of what it was. On the other side here, if I did use x equals the negative 1 and negative 2. Of course, y is equal to 2 to the power of negative negative 1, which is just 2 to the positive 1, right? So that would be 2. So negative 1, we're at 2. Negative 2, well, 2 to the power of negative negative 2 is 4. So our graph looks like that. Just like it did up above, only it's flipped over. It's a mirror image of itself. Again, what we're concerned with, like I said, is this part here. It starts out at 1, and it decays. Every period of time, it gets cut in half. That's because it's 2. Like I said, if it was a 4, it would get cut to a fourth at every period of time. So this is very, very useful for us in helping us to, to plot out the activity of a, something that builds, grows exponentially, like populations, bacteria colonies grow exponentially like this, or things that decay exponentially like radioactivity, um, decomposition of certain materials, um, decay of the charge on a capacitor, inductors, the charge and the current through inductors has similar behavior. So all we have to do is Figure out what the time frame is in which that decays to half or doubles in growth, whatever, whichever direction we're going, and somehow adjust it so that time frame matches up with one unit. And then our starting value, since this starts at 1, we just adjust that starting value by multiplying it by whatever it is to get where we're starting from. One of the simplest examples, okay, so we have a Adjusting that power can make it grow or shrink. We can also look at it like this. So I've got y equals b to the power of x. In the last example, b was 2. If b is 3, how does that change the graph? Here's 1. It still goes through 1. But when x is 1, y is now going to be 3. When x is 2, y is going to be 9. It goes up pretty steep like that. If I change that to y equals 4 to the x, how does that change? Well, it gets even steeper here. When x is 1, y is 4. And it shrinks down faster here. 1 fourth, 1 sixteenth, and so on. So, yeah, it's going up 4 every time. 4 times every, every jump. Yeah, dividing by 4 if you're going to the left, multiplying by 4 if you're going to the right. What it's saying is for every 1x, y is being multiplied by 4. Every change in 1 of x. 
So this is 1 here. y is 1 when x is 0. If x goes up to 1, y is multiplied by 4. 1 times 4 is 4. If x goes up another 1 to 2, it's multiplied by 4. 4 times 4 would be 16. If it goes back 1, it's divided by 4. So it goes from 1 down to a 4th. Goes back another 1, goes from a 4th down to a 16th. So the value of y is either multiplied or divided by 4 every time you move. Almost like having octal numbers. In fact, if you did y equals, I'll change colors here, y equals 8 to the x, what we're going to get here is actually our place values of our octal numbers. If x is 0, this is 1. If x is 1, it's 8. If it's 2, it's 64. If it's 3, it's 512. 4 is 4096. 1 is 1 8th, 2 is 1 64th, and so on. If B is less than 1, let's say B is 1 half, then it's going to be the opposite thing. Yeah, let's try it out here. 1 half to the 0 is still 1, because anything to the 0 is 1, but it's 1 half to the power of 1. That's just one half. One half to the power of two. That's one fourth. Power of three is one eighth. Power of negative one is actually going to be two. What we find here is y equals one half to the power of x is equivalent of y equals two to the power of negative x. Why is that? Well, because we've said before that this negative in the exponent is a reciprocal. That negative in the exponent just means that 2 behaves as 1 over 2 or 1 half. So these are equivalent. So I can do my exponential decay either way. Okay, so let's look at examples of exponential growth here. Probably one of the simplest examples of exponential growth one that most of us will uh, encounter in our life, hopefully at some point, is compound interest. In compound interest, we are looking at the balance of the, the amount of money, the future value, if you want to call it that, the ending balance. I'm going to use FB, which stands for future value. So that's the future balance of that. So that future amount is going to be equal to our starting amount, which I'm going to call the present value, times 1 plus R is our rate. You know, rate is a percent as a decimal. Divided by K, where K is your number of periods in a year. So if it's compounded quarterly, K would be 4. Compounded monthly, K would be 12. Compounded semi-annually, K would be 2, twice a year, right? To the power of K times T, where T is your number of years. So what does this mean? That means if you invest $2,000 at 8% interest, Compounded quarterly, every three months, four times a year. I, I, I think I said four times a year, but I might have said every four months, if possible. For five years. So the growth here, that future value, the value at the end of the five years, is going to be our starting amount, the $2,000, times 1 plus, what's my rate? 8%, so we're going to put in as 0.08. It's our rate as a decimal, percent as a decimal. Divided by, quarterly is 4, 4 times a year. It's every 3 months, but it's 4 times a year. Yeah, K is the number of times in a year, number of periods in a year. Then to the power of, k is still 4, times, what's t? 
five years. It's retired. So this ends up being 2,000 times, put it in parentheses, 1 plus 0 0.08 divided by 4, close my parentheses, to the power of, well, I'm just going to do 4 times 5 is 20, make it easier on myself. And I get 2971.89. So in five years, that grows from $2,000 to $2,971.89. Not so bad? Don't, not sure? Okay, I'm going to have you guys try one. You're going to invest $4,500 at 9% compounded monthly for 10 years. See what you come up with. Let's see, look. So we started out with 4,500 times. We have 1 plus the 9% becomes 0 0.09. How many times a year is this? 12 because it's monthly. So divide by 12, and the power of 12 times 10, because 12 months in a year times 10 years. 4,500 times 1 plus 0 0.09 divided by 12. And I'm just going to put in the power of 120. Actually, a little bit more, 11,031 and 11 cents. On your calculator, you're going to type in 4,500 times, open parentheses, 1 plus 0 0.09 divided by 12, close parentheses. Now you've got your power key there, right? Your caret key. Hit the caret key, then you're going to have to do open parentheses, 12 times 10. And close your parentheses. Okay. Yep, $11,031.11. Okay. That's 0 0.09 divided by 12. Yeah, I should have. That's why down here I put in the division sign and say the slash. I'm used to the slash being in there for the formula, but it does mean division. Yeah, 0 0.09, you do fraction 12. It doesn't like having decimals within your fractions, and some calculators will spit it back out. <clears throat> okay. Another example of, so I mean, obviously this is an exponential function. If we were going to graph it, we would just say your future value or the value of that account is equal to the $4,500 times 1 plus... Um, the 0 0.09 divided by 12 to the power of 12 times t, where t is your variable. And you would get a graph. It would look something like this. It would start out at $4,500 here. And it would grow each year. And it's going to have a curve like this. And just like all the other exponentials, that curve gets steeper and steeper and steeper over time, every period. Um, if you ever see it done out, the compound interest, if you start like 25, if you put a piece of, of sum of money, oh, let's do it, let's grab it. We've got a second here. I'll make this a little bit larger for you. So let's say you start out at, how old are you guys at? How many of you are under 23? 22. So let's say you're going to get out of here, you're going to be 20, let's say you're going to be 25 years old when you get out of here. When you when we get that first good job and get established. We're going to give you a couple of years to get that good job and get established. Retirement now, IRS says, or Social Security says, 
can't draw full full social security till 67. It's probably gonna be like 68 or 69 for you guys. Let's say you put away just two thousand dollars even. Actually, I'll do this. We're going to say you get 10% uh, of your return. This number is actually going to be kind of shocking down here, but we're not going to look at that. We want to look at the graph. Just going to make a very quick exponential graph for you. So you can see there, that balance starts out at $2,000 and it gets steeper, steeper. The, the longer it sits there, the faster it grows. So I mean, if you only let it sit there for 20 years, somewhere in here is where it stops. It hasn't hit that steep growth curve yet. That's why you know, they talk about saving money for retirement when you're young. This is exactly why, because it's the nature of that exponential function. It gets really steep. It gets steeper and steeper the longer it sits there. It goes faster. You can see here the last five years from about 62 to 67. Well, here's 62 right about here. Um, it grew more in that last five years than it did in pretty much the whole first 30 years. Okay, enough playing with that. But you can see it does take on that exponential What was the final number in that? I said 2,000. I'm at 25 to 67, so that's 42 years. I'm off on that one. 25 to 67 is what I went. Now that looks about right, about $109,000. That's only $2,000 you start out with. Yep. Don't put any more in. No. So now if that was $4,000, that would double. You're allowed for IRAs, you're allowed to put in, I think, like $5,500 now. So you put in $5,000, that's half a million dollars in your return. No, that's just once. That's at age 25. You put it away at age 25 and let it sit to your 67. Just once. Well, you can put you can put fifty five hundred into IRAs, and then you can put more into tax sheltered annuities. I think you can put up to like twenty thousand or something like that into tax shelters. That is a similar thing. The difference is, is an IRA you take a lump sum of money that you have and you invest it whenever you want to, up to that amount in a year. A tax shelter, the four hundred one k they call it, has to come out of your paycheck every pay period. So that has to add up for that that has to automatically come out of your paycheck. That's why you're allowed to put more into that than you are into the IRA. How do you find out about all stuff? Go to a good investment planner. Um, you know, there's like Fidelity, uh, Edward Jones, Allstate does State Farm, Allstate, like a bunch of those do investment. Just go into the yellow pages and look up investment planners. And I would talk to a few of them. Because each of them is going to have their own little bit of a different strategy that they have. Talk to someone and see which ones make you feel the best. And be open with them. Just say, I'm talking to different investment planners to see which one I think I want to go with. Mm -hmm. But it's uh, pretty impressive when you look at it. Okay. I've got to show you guys since the topic came up. That's like age 25 you can start? You, you can start at actually 16. You can start putting money away. No, but into that. Yep, you can start at age 16 putting it away up to 5,500 a year. The only catch is you cannot put away more than what you earn. So let's say you're 16 years old and you only earn $3,000 that year at your part time job, you can only put away up to $3,000. So you can put up like 5,500 every year then? Every year, yeah. So let's do this. Some of you are going to be like 23 when you get out of here, so let's do that. You're going to be 19? Let's start at 20. Let's 
Oops, I don't really want to go up. You're not going to live to be 160. We wish you would, but not going to happen. Let's just put 5,000. So you're putting away five thousand dollars every year till you hit sixty-seven here. Fifty-five hundred every year. Yep. No, it's it starts recalculating after you put the new amount in. Yep. Oh, no, no. It, it figures out the interest on the first amount, adds it in, then adds your 5000 Then it adds interest. Here, I'll show you. So it'll calculate the interest from here? Yes. So this is 10% interest. You put in 5000 right? You didn't get any interest the first year. The second year, you put away another 5000 So you've got the first 5000 plus that 5000 would be 10000 plus... Five hundred dollars worth of interest off the first year's money. The interest is way more than your con contribution here. Let me uh, let me show you how this works. So I'll try to do this quick. That's exactly where I'm. That's exactly where I'm going with this. So here, if you put away five, start at twenty and put away five thousand a year at sixty-seven, you'd have four point eight million dollars. That's at ten percent, which is to the middle to the high end. I mean, a lot of good investment counselors will tell you if you're going to put money away and you're going to save over forty years, you should be able to average between eleven and thirteen percent return per year. So ten percent is middle to high. Um, Eight percent would be considered low on a long-term investment. What would it be if you put the maximum every year? Let me come back to that. But you can see here that's five thousand a year. Now, let's say you're older. You know, you're going to start at twenty. You're going to start at twenty-three. Just back up three years here. So you would only have like thirty-six, three point six million. If you had to back up ten years, well, you're only going to have one point eight million if you put away five thousand a year. But here's what's beautiful about this. Okay, so let's say you do get out of here, you start at 20. You put money away until you're like 29, and you say, screw it, I'm done saving. How bad do you think you're going to get hurt if you stop at age 29, you don't put any more money away? Still got 2.9 million, almost 3 million. Almost cut in half. How about this person who says, you know what, I'm young, I want to play, I went to school, I worked hard, I want a new car, I want a snowmobile. And then at 30, well, we'll get there. But this person here plays with their money for the first 9, 10 years, and then starts saving. This person put 5,000 a year away for 10 years. That's $50,000. This person put 5,000 a year away starting at 30 going to 67. That's 37 years. They put away $185,000. So 50000 185000 Guess who's ahead at 67? It's not even close. I mean, it's still pretty good, but this person's a million dollars ahead, and they only invested for 10 years. This person invested for 37 years. Okay, now I'll give you your, if you give you two or three years, I mean, you can still be a millionaire in your retirement until you start putting away five grand a year. I realize it's tough to start putting away five grand a year, but realistically, if I uh, go back here, I think I should be able to back it up that far. So this person's only putting it away for eight years. This person's putting it away for 40. This one's still ahead. And this is, I've seen this set up starting at several different ages. I think if I go one more year, this person's going to catch up. And they do. This person actually gets slightly ahead. But I've seen this done several times. That first eight years of your life when you start working, 
is worth more than the rest of your life. So if you save for that first eight years and never save again, you're way better off than if you screw around for eight years and save every year for the rest of your life. Something to think about. And again, I don't want to dwell on that too much because we do have to cover some other stuff. But it's uh, that compound interest, that exponential growth is just amazing. And it's just because at that tail end, you see that curve gets steeper and steeper and steeper. Mm -hmm. So the earlier you can start, the, the further into that steep part of the curve you can get to. Starting, I believe it's at age 70 or 69, one of the two, you have to start taking out a certain percentage every year. So it's, I think it's like 8% when you're 70, and, and I think the percent changes as you get older. But there is an age where you have to start taking some of it out. But if you do it right, if you invest it in Roth IRAs, then you, there's no taxes on it when you draw it out. So you can draw it out and put it in a regular savings account and it really don't matter. You're not paying anything. Well, you can't. You you, you don't have to be retired, but you, you have to be 59. If you wait till you're 59 and a half, there are no penalties. If you're younger than 59 and a half, then it depends on what type of investment. If you did a regular IRA, that's where you get a tax deduction off your tax forms when you put the money in. Then if you take it out, you pay penalties. It's your, you pay your normal income tax plus 10% penalty. If it's a TSA tax shelter or 401k, it's the same thing. You pay your regular tax plus 10% penalty. So it usually ends up being 35 to 40% you'll pay. Um, if it's a Roth IRA, which means you pay, this is money you've already paid the taxes on before you invest it. You don't get a tax deduction. Then you can draw out the principal. So you put away that $5,000 a year. Let's say that after five years you need money for something. You've got that 25000 that you put in. You can draw that much out without any penalties. You just have to leave any interest that's been earned has to stay in there. So it's, I mean, I use it as my rainy day fund. If I have money that I'm going to put in a rainy day fund, I'll put it in a Roth IRA. Yeah. That way it's gaining interest and in going towards my retirement. So if I don't need it, I've got a retirement fund. Mm -hmm. If I do need it, I can still draw out that 5000 Because if I put it in a bank account, I'm not getting any interest on it anyway. Yeah. The only drawback is in a Roth IRA, it takes you like two weeks to withdraw it. So it takes a while to get the money out. Okay, so let's look at decay. Radioactive decay. I'm looking at half-life is the number of years it takes for something to get to half of its value. So let's say we have a, a substance here with a half-life of 30 years. And we're going to start with an initial amount of 500 grams of it. Or kilograms, let's go. So 500 kilograms of this material has a half-life of 30 years. The amount that you have, the amount is going to be equal to the initial amount, A with a little 1, or sometimes A with a 0, that's pronounced A0. A0 is at time equals 0, is what that stands for. So AI stands for A initial, or A0 for beginning amount, times... 2 to the power of negative t divided by the half-life. I'm going to use h for half-life. They sometimes use that script t. It's called tau. It's sometimes used for half-life. And that's going to come in as a time constant when we look at circuits. Another way you could have written this is it could have been that initial amount times 1 half to the power of t over the half-life. Notice instead of putting the negative in front of the t, I made it a 1 half instead of a 2. They mean exactly the same thing. So let's let's figure out how much will we have at 50 years. So after 50 years, how much are we going to have? So we started out with 500 kilograms times, I don't need the parentheses there, but times 2 to the power of negative 50 divided by 30. That's a division. It's a fraction, but it's also a division. So I'm going to do is I'm going to put it in my calculator. 500 times 2 to the power of parentheses. For negative, make sure you use the negative and not the minus. 50 divided by 30. I'm going to close the parentheses. Equals. 
Come on. So 157.49. Kilograms. So it's down to about a third of what it started out at. The 50 is the number of years I put it in. 30 is the half life, and negative is out of the formula. You ever hear of the letter E, the natural constant? Letter E is actually defined to be 1 plus 1 over n to the power of n, where n goes gets an in, is infinitely large, basically. And what it ends up being is 2.718281828455. It goes on forever. You can actually get it on your calculators. You should have an E somewhere. I have, you should have an LN key. Usually above the LN key, there's an E to the X. So if you hit second, E to the X, and put E to the power of one, because you have to put in a power usually, so put E to the power of one, that's just gonna give you the value of E. You can see there, 2.718281828, blah, 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 blah. That is E. That's the natural constant. That is used in a lot of these growth and decay functions. Um, if you want to do continuously compounding interest for banking, they, some banks used to do that. It would be E would be in that function. For circuits, this natural constant, the letter E, again, just this, so E equals that. It's just a lot of things in nature grow in that way. Your exponential growth and your exponential decay in nature, that number for some reason gives you the growth rate and the decay rate. So for like the matter Yes. I mean they all have the the decay half lives. But the, the natural the E is the natural constant and a lot of that decay and growth. For some reason, that's what makes the formula work, is using E, then you adjust it with the, the half-lives. So for you guys, for circuits, if you are looking at a an RC circuit, a resistor capacitor circuit, so you have a voltage source, you have a resistor, and you have a capacitor. Actually, generally, you guys draw your capacitor with one curved plate now, don't you? Okay. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to do this. I'm actually going to put in a switch. So we're going to say this is open right now. When I close that switch, the capacitor starts to charge. The voltage on that capacitor is equal to V naught, which is the voltage of my voltage source, times E to the power of negative T. over RC, where RC is our time constant. Does that make sense? Actually, this is discharging the capacitor. If I, if I close the switch and I let it charge up to where it's the same voltage as the voltage source, and I take out the, I start out the voltage source and close the switch and let the capacitor decay, this is the decaying of that capacitor. Okay, well, he, you can do it with a half-life. But he may, he may have just put in 2.71 or 2.72 instead of E. Time constant. Yeah, the time constant is the time it takes to cut the voltage in half. Yeah. Similar to it. And actually, i got to be careful. Um, the time constant isn't necessarily what it takes to cut it in half. It's to cut it to a certain percentage. Um, I want to say it's at 71% or something like that. It's a square root of 2 or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we are out of time right now, so we will go over this more tomorrow. But in your packet, it is page 469. If you want to look at 1 through 25, the odd. 
The formulas are in the packet. See what you can figure out. We'll discuss more of these on Monday.